have personally followed and supported Israel's heroic struggle for survival? We set up the Israeli government in Palestine, moved some of the Arabs out. They've done things over there that never have been done in that part of the world before. In times of war and times of peace, every president of the United States since Harry Truman and every Congress has understood the importance of Israel. Today's my opportunity to once again look him in the eye and tell him he's got no better friend in the United States. Justice and hope are at the heart of the Zionist idea. I'm proud that the security relationship between the United States and Israel has never been stronger. In an unstable and uncertain Middle East, the need for our alliance is greater than ever. The United States recognizes Israel's absolute right to defend itself. And today, I am taking historic action to promote Israel's ability to defend itself. We've done more to help bolster Israel's security than any other administration in history. The U.S. has played a central role in Israel's international support since 1948. Over time, a system of oppression and injustice took hold. While presidents paid lip service to peace, peace will have to be made among peoples, not just governments. Today, Israel takes a big step towards peace. Their actions led to something different. For the first time, a United Nations agency has used the term apartheid to describe the situation Palestinians face every day in the occupied territories. Today, millions of Palestinians live under a regime of apartheid and supremacy. We stand with Israel because we believe in right over wrong, in good over evil, and in liberty over tyranny. The US currently gives Israel $3.8 billion in military funding each year, far more than they give to any other foreign military. The largest single security assistance pledge in American history. In 2016, the US Congress committed to pay that amount for 10 years, though new bipartisan legislation in 2020 aims to extend that agreement. In the current Congress, there is a piece of legislation, and what this bill would do is codify into law the $38 billion that President Obama pledged to Israel in 2016. But not only would it do that, but instead of making the $38 billion a ceiling, it would actually make it just a floor so that the United States would provide at least $38 billion in funding for weapons and potentially even more. Since 1948, the U.S. has spent nearly $150 billion of taxpayer money supporting Israel's military. The U.S. has provided more aid to Israel since World War II than all of Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America combined. Between 2000 and 2009 alone, the U.S. sent 670 million weapons to Israel. During that time, thousands of Palestinians were killed by the Israeli military Virtually all of that money goes to weapons that, that Israel then you know, buys from, from American companies. Israel buys from the United States everything from small arms to big ticket items like fighter jets. Every time Israel bombs Gaza, you can be sure that American equipment and weapons are part of that. Unlike what the Israel lobby claims, in the United States that these weapons are for Israel's defense. They're actually for Israel's offensive capabilities and are used almost exclusively against innocent civilians, Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Israel has annexed Palestinian land and controls all access to water, resources and movement. It has put Gaza under a suffocating siege for 14 years, with 2 million Palestinians living in an open-air prison that is regularly bombed. Palestinians are often detained and imprisoned without charge, even as young as 12. Israel demolishes Palestinian homes, which leaves entire families displaced. Israel has killed thousands of Palestinians with impunity. In the case of Iyad Halak, a Palestinian with autism, he was gunned down by an Israeli police officer. That person was never charged. 
All of this is sponsored by U.S. taxpayers. The United States has long been loath to um, hold Israel accountable for human rights violations. And the fact is that they don't. The United States is definitely culpable of enabling Israel's human rights abuses and atrocities against the Palestinian people. When a uh, Palestinian youth whose home is raided and who is blindfolded in the middle of the night and ripped away from their parents and brought to military detention, often subjected to physical abuse, sometimes even torture, even that act, it's the bullets and the guns, it's often the jeeps that the Israeli military uses that are purchased by U.S. military aid. There's no conceivable way that the Israeli military could undertake any action whatsoever in the occupied Palestinian territories that doesn't involve, in some degree, U.S. military funding. The U.S. is obligated by law to stop funding human rights abuses, but for decades it has ignored that law and supported Israel's injustice and oppression of Palestinians. The U.S. has conditioned that aid through U.S. laws, which conditions the use of U.S. military support for to achieve military advantages that do not fundamentally violate human rights. And yet here you have a situation where all military uh, support to Israel is violating Palestinian human rights. Last November, I introduced a bill in Congress. It says that U.S. aid to Israel shall be prohibited from being used to arrest, detain, abuse, torture, or otherwise violate humanitarian law and the human rights of Palestinian children. What we've seen recently in U.S. Congress is what many have described as an insurgency in the sense that it, it is no longer just the political establishment recreating itself, but political actors that are entering the scene who are disrupting. The idea of even conditioning military funding to Israel was viewed as a holy cow, the proverbial third rail that couldn't be touched. The, the idea of the bipartisan consensus on Israel is, is something that emerged really in the 1980s and 90s. It is a reflection in every way of the unique and special relationship between the United States and Israel because Israel gets benefits that other allies and partners around the world and in the region do not get. The Palestinian people have a right to live in peace and security as well. At a time when we spend, I think it's $3.8 billion on military aid to Israel, we have a right to say to the Israeli government that the United States of America and our taxpayers and our people believe in human rights we believe in democracy. We will not accept authoritarianism or racism. And we demand that the Israeli government sit down with the Palestinian people and negotiate an agreement that works for all parties. Before 2020, the Bernie Sanders campaign really championed the issue of taking a uh, a fair and balanced approach that deliberately, consciously humanized Palestinians, which is something that had been missing. But I think it was it's a practical realization that there are changes happening within the grassroots of the party. So we're talking about a handful of, of congressional members within that large number. So we're not going to see a major sea change as a result of their participation. But their participation is disrupting a status quo where this the, the military support to Israel was just understood as a pillar of U.S. Middle East foreign policy. And so what they did is that they've actually made it controversial and they've made it into a conversation. Joe Biden, the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party, has refused to condition funding to Israel. I think it's about time we stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body for apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made. None. It is the best three billion dollar investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. What the hell is going to be the next venue?
18,700 people. We're all united by our unyielding, and I mean it literally, unyielding commitment to the survival, security, and success of the Jewish state of Israel. Even though he understood Israel's apartheid reality. They're moving us, and more importantly, they're moving Israel in the wrong direction. They're moving us toward a one-state reality, and that reality is dangerous. However, the base of the Democratic Party doesn't agree with Joe. The majority of Democrats believe in taking action against Israel for its abuses of international law and human rights. Sort of among progressives, there is a real questioning of this military aid to Israel. We must be asking, as Israel's ally, the Netanyahu government to ensure full rights for Palestinians if we are to give them aid. What's different now is that you have an organized, mobilized constituency that cares about Palestinian rights, that pushing back is having an effect. It is helping to change the discourse. We're not there yet. We've got a long way to go before Palestinian humanity is treated in the same way that uh, Jewish or Israeli humanity is treated in the American political discourse, but at least we're starting to talk about the issue. Without justice, there can't be peace. As a Palestinian American abolitionist, anti-imperialist, um, I, I would tell Biden that all people deserve the right to determine their own futures, economically, socially, politically, um, and that we are, we are not only impeding that opportunity for Palestinians to achieve that future, we are making it fundamentally um, impossible. So the United States is actually um, a source of tremendous harm, and the best thing that the U.S. can do for the Middle East is to get out of it. You have to understand if the, if the idea is to condition aid, it should be because that is the first step to ending aid.